May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. For a few minutes this morning, I want you to think that Luke 20, 27 to 38 is not set in a first century synagogue in Palestine, but is set in a 21st century church in America. We are caught in this, in a debate about eternal life and resurrection. On the one side, there are the biblical literalists who believe every word of the Bible is written by God and is true. On the other side are the biblical liberals who are open to understanding scripture and life that is to come beyond the confines of 66 books of the Bible. In the middle of this is Jesus. Now Jesus is the new kid on the block, the new pastor who's just arrived from rural Nebraska. The two sides want to find out if the new kid on the block is going to be like the biblical literalists or if he's going to be like the biblical liberals. So they present him as biblical literalist with a riddle. Has this ever happened to you? Has someone ever tried to get you in an argument over your beliefs? I'm sure it has at some point or another. Or maybe you've done it with somebody else. I've had many encounters like this. Somebody comes and asks a question about the Bible or something about theology. It doesn't happen as often as you might think, but it does happen. How I respond is largely based on what I think the motive of the person is that's asking the question. Is that person really seeking truth or a deeper understanding of a particular text? Or is that person trying to get me to perpetuate a belief that she or he has had for a long time with no intention of changing? Is it a trap or is it a genuine question? It's generally the latter, I've found, through time. I suspect that's the way it is here as well for Jesus as he's confronted by the religious leadership in Jerusalem. They're not interested in seeking truth. They're interested in trapping him to prove they're right about their beliefs. They're trying to stick a riddle under Jesus' nose so they can trap him to get his view, which in their mind is the wrong view, of heaven and resurrection. Guess what? It doesn't work. The new kid on the block is a lot smarter than they think. So what is Jesus saying about heaven here? Despite what your beliefs might be about life after this existence, Jesus says that the life to come is not simply a continuation of this present existence. If it were, I would think that there are plenty of people on earth for whom such a prospect would not be a positive one. Jesus says that the God that we worship is the God of the living. And guess what? In saying this, he quotes scripture and he actually returns to Moses. The biblical literalists are mad at what he's pulled off. The biblical liberals, as usual, are scratching their heads trying to figure out what he's talking about. <laughs> so, but what does it mean that God is the God of the living? We can buy that, I think, with our whole hearts. We can believe it in our hearts, but we want to know what is the living going to be here. We want answers. We want clear, unequivocal images of heaven that will encourage us to keep on going. Honestly, we got to be honest about this. We want a rational explanation and a picture of heaven that looks just like the one that's in our mind. But that's not what the Bible is for, according to Jesus. The Bible doesn't rationally explain heaven. The Bible talks about life to come as mystery. That's what we have is mystery. So it's kind of dark and murky and a glass that we see through dimly as the Apostle Paul writes. It's not crystal clear, it's absolute mystery. What I think Jesus is saying is that those who are willing to give their lives to God now will find God to be there when the journey of life is over. What we will discover there is beyond our wildest imaginations, but it will be a life as God has created it to be, and all our wondering about it, all our conjectures, all our images won't even really make a difference. It all comes down to faith. It all comes down to faith.
simply faith in each one of us, faith on earth, as we read in other parts of the Gospel of Luke. Today, we gather to recognize the people in our congregations who lived their lives and gave their lives in faith. All their lives came down to a matter of faith. And it's not our purpose today, or for any day for that matter, to question the amount of faith they had or how they expressed it and whether we think that's good enough. Our purpose is to look at ourselves and our own faith and ask those questions. Focus on ourselves on that question. Pastor Earl Martin Fritz died on this Sunday, one year ago, in the afternoon. He died at home with his wife Pauline and his son John by his side. Earl and Pauline were married for 70 years. Earl was ordained in 1955 in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. He lived a life of love, of friendship, and faith. Earl was a Lutheran pastor through and through, serving actively for more than 50 years in, in churches around Ohio and, and beyond, and then supply preaching for the rest of his life. He was one of the finest pastors I have ever known, and I think anyone who knew him would agree. Earl's greatest pleasures in life were vacationing in the mountains, climbing 14,000-foot peaks. Do I need to repeat that? It's just just the, the thinness of the air gets to you thinking about his, him climbing there and listening to the music of organs and symphonies. He enhanced several homes with his stained glass windows, and he built his home in Gehanna. The community and all welfare organizations in the community were hallmarks of his life as he served others. He was loved and admired by all. For all of us who are blessed to know him, there is so much more to say about Earl. He was a magnificent man. And as we go through this sermon today, I want everyone to join me in saying thanks be to God for each person. So thanks be to God for Earl Pritz. Denise Worcester died one week after Earl in November 2021. She spent 23 years at the preschool of First Community Church, first as a teacher and later as director of early childhood ministry. She touched the lives of thousands of parents and children, including everyone in my household, through her mentorship of parenting groups, through her research, through her writing on child development. She was one of the greatest writers on child development that I've ever known. She continued to support people after her retirement, especially through her work with the Young Association of Central Ohio. She was a loving mother, a fantastic nana, a great sister, a great friend to people across all generations and all faiths, everyone she met. She loved music and art. She loved OSU women's basketball and knitting and walks in nature preserves. We were blessed in the final years of her life that she chose to come among us as a member and friend. And she served as a deacon even though she was battling through cancer to the last day of her life. Thanks be to God for Donise Worcester. Thanks be to God for Donise Worcester. Vicki Ellen Kuchba died on Christmas Eve, 2021. Vicki was married to Bill here at First Church on December 14, 1974. Vicki was filled with joy. She was very active in many philanthropic and fraternal organizations through the years, and she loved to travel, including many trips and cruises through the years. She took her grandkids on a Disney cruise a couple years before she died, and it's said that she had more fun on that cruise than anyone else, <laughs> even her grandchildren. She was so kind and so thoughtful toward everyone. She always went out of her way to assist anyone wherever possible. She loved angels and pixies and sunsets and clouds and rainbows, and especially she loved Christmas and she loved Santa. Vicki was in love with life. Thanks be to God for Vicki Kuchba. 
Thanks be to God for Vicki Kuchba. Ruth Allred was a member of First Church for over 25 years. Until her move to Texas, she was active here all the time, quietly and thoughtfully calling upon those who were sick and often forgotten by everybody else. As senior deacon, I remember meeting with Ruth regularly to plan the deacon's activities and to plan worship. And I always used to laugh because we'd sit down together with a cookie and a cup of coffee and she'd say, well, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> said, I don't know. I said, great, we're in this together. So, but she always was in support of this church. I always loved her gentle, quiet, and clear way. She brought her grandchildren, Ben and Jensen, here to church, and we were all blessed by their presence among us. And Ben is with us today, and Jensen's watching. Ruth was a great grandmother. For the last years of her life, she moved to Texas to be closer to her grandchildren there. She blessed all of our lives and all who knew her. Thanks be to God for Ruth Allred. Thanks be to God for Ruth Allred. Paul Flocken was diagnosed as a young teen with a life-threatening kidney disease, but Paul was the recipient of a miracle. Healed by faith, his kidney disease disappeared, and he went on to a full life. He was able to move on and start a full and exciting life. Paul's adventures began at 17 with him entering the army. He did two tours of duty in Vietnam in the 82nd Airborne Division, and he was crew chief for medical evacuation helicopters. Without any regard for his own life, he fiercely was determined to rescue injured soldiers in the field of battle. As a result of his bravery and skill, he was presented with the Bronze Star Medal, the Distinguished Flying Cross, and the Vietnam Cross of Gallantry. As a sergeant in the Army after Vietnam, Paul went on to become a jump master in the paratroopers and a scuba diving master while stationed in the United Nations peacekeeping forces in Egypt. And then many of us got to know him after all of that. He came here to First Church and was always active in our life together as a deacon and an usher. He would say to me, Mark, before we had a security team, at that door every Sunday, he says, Tim, I got your back. And he did. He had every one of our backs. You could see him warmly welcoming people to First Church every Sunday as he was also silently guarding Broad Street. He was a true servant of God who sought to live his life in love to Jesus. He would cook and serve meals, care for the homeless poor, lead and serve at Bethlehem on Broad Street Christmas celebrations for the poor. Beside his mother, he gets a sainthood just for that. He worked with Arlene every single Christmas right there, and he said, she who must be, what? Obeyed. Obeyed. We all know the answer, right? And there he was, shoulder to shoulder with his dear mom. He was active in book and Bible study. He was, was ecumenical in all ways, a longtime member of Cum Cristo and a home builder of many homes with Habitat for Humanity. Paul was a soldier for Christ, and a servant of God. Thanks be to God for Paul Flocken. Thanks be to God for Paul Flocken. Ed Cates was our longest standing member at the time of his death in April, and he was very proud of that. Ed loved his life and his wife more than anyone I've ever seen, and following her death in 2013, he would go to see her at her grave every day. It was amazing. And you know, because some days you had to take him when it was snowing, <laughs> you wouldn't let him drive. They met when they were 15, and he fell in love right away. She wasn't so convinced immediately. But they married at 19, right here at First Congregational Church in 1946. Ed owned and operated W.E. Davis Insurance Company beginning in 1962, and the family still owns it and operates it 60 years later. Ed loved to work with his hands and kept active all the time by gardening and remodeling. He was always working on something. He was so proud to be a member of this church. He served as a deacon, a trustee, a Sunday school teacher, and he hosted the 60-plus group with Marilyn. Married 66 years, Marilyn and Ed were a true love story. They loved their family, which resulted in many family traditions, including Friday night 
babysitting for the grandkids, hosting the family dinner every Sunday, and yearly vacations to Fl the Florida beach where they had a condo for many years. He was amazing. When I was with him at the very end, I was able to see one last time those incredible blue eyes as they smiled and told him that we loved each other, we exchanged one last farewell. Ed Cates was a jewel. Thanks be to God for Ed Cates. Thanks be to God for Ed Cates. Tammy Anderson died too young, way too young. She was 53 years old at the age of her death, suddenly on May 13th. She was active here for many, many years. She was always present and always supportive of all things related to children and youth ministry. We will always remember her special support of the annual cookie mission. She was the first one with the tins and spreading the cheer around and then delivering them as well. At the spring, treat, every, spring retreat every year, she was at the craft table, Mark and, and Tammy together. I always thought that's when she was in her bliss, there in the camp with the kids. Sunday school support was just second nature to her. You could always find her behind the scenes supporting this church in humble and kind ways. She was fun, she was funny, she was a light in our community of faith. She shined from her heart every single day. Tammy was married to Eddie Anderson III and was mother to Morgan and Eddie IV and Chutney, grandmother to Eddie and Nicolette. And family is here today. I know you miss her most of all. We miss her too. Thanks be to God for Tammy Anderson. Thanks be to God for Tammy Anderson. And Barbara Knox entered eternal life just a few weeks ago, October 1st. She was married to David for more than 60 years. She was a great woman, quietly, thoughtfully, prayerfully, lovingly. She lived her life as a testimony to art and beauty and what is good and true in this world. She was active as a docent at the Columbus Museum of Art and was there here each week in worship until her health, particularly her memory, declined so badly that she could no longer make it to church. She was at Westminster Thurber when she died. She was active in all our book studies and edited my Bible study, Acts Comes Alive, and she found about 300 typos. That may not surprise Marty. <laughs> Doesn't surprise me. One of my favorite memories of Barbara was an afternoon when she came into my office and I was sitting at my desk and she said, you need to come next door and see the art museum now. You need to get away from all your books and big ideas and deep thoughts and you need to walk the galleries with me. And for the next three hours, she took me through the art museum. It was the best afternoon of my life at First Church. She was a gift from God to all of us. Thanks be to God for Barbara Knox. Thanks be to God for Barbara Knox. Today we give thanks for these eight shining lights of love in our lives. We also give thanks for all the saints of our lives who have pointed us to a way of living and loving and giving that brings hope to this world each day. Today, ours should be an endless Alleluia. For all the saints, we say, thanks be to God. Amen.